that came out this year. Um, so we wanted to hold a session all this together to talk about this book. Um, this is the last time. Uh, this is the last time we'll be talking to everyone all together. So there's probably a couple of program announcements. Uh, some of you uh, were able to sign up successfully for the Bancroft exhibit, and that's going to start at 12:30. Um, we're running a little bit behind, which is totally fine. But the librarians, as you can imagine, run very much on time. So if your ticket says 12:30. Dean Smith is going to expect you over there at 12.30, um, so just keep that in mind. Um, we also have two events this evening that are going to be in Oakland, uh, and you can park there. It's just two BART stops away. The first is going to be the gallery show at Royal Nonsuch Gallery on Telegraph. The address is in the program, and then just three blocks away from that will be the big reading tonight at the Omni Commons, uh, so please come on out for both of those. Um, at the gallery, there's going to be a limited edition uh, broad side of Kevin Killian's new poem that he wrote for the show. Uh, so please stop by and pick that up. All right, that's it. Welcome, yeah. Kevin Killian and Dodie Bowie. Hey, everybody. I'm Kevin Killian. And um, <laughs> there's Dodie over here. Uh, the other people on stage are among the writers who we uh, asked to contribute to our new narrative anthology, Writers Who Love Too Much. So we asked them all to think about how we, yeah, it was like go back, go back into your minds and remember what the, the dawn of new narrative, you might say, or at least when we got to know, know you all. So everybody's got a different story and it'll be very informal. I'm going to read from a little bit of our introduction to the book, Writers Who Love Too Much. Is this being photographed? I should be holding up this book very <laughs> And I'm just, I'm going to read a little bit of that, and Dodie will, uh, will come on, and she's got another kind of salute to it to our panelists here. And this, yeah, any student of Bob and Bruce had the exhilaration of participating on the one hand at the cutting edge of something entirely new, and also the sheer comfort of the oldest cradle in the world, that of a mother and father creating a world for their young ones. <laughs> Bob's Jewish pragmatism and Bruce's Catholic emotionalism, or vice versa, <laughs> kept things hopping between them intellectually. And yet Bob writes Marjorie Kemp, who marvels the critic Danny Kennedy, which seems to me the great, somewhat neglected novel of the pack, and one dripping with the grandeur of Catholic lust. <laughs> Bob was the extrovert. It was he who taught the workshops, who dealt with us all on a daily level. While Bruce had the effective role of a ghost, spied in the shadows here and there. In the shadows, at a party, you might hear his voice in your ear, a wise whisper, Bob Gluck has been telling me you're a writer to look out for. <laughs> Bob was so friendly, it seemed initially easy to win his favor. But to interest Bruce, one really had to display the right stuff, or perhaps to be boyish and goyish in a way that neither me or Dodie actually were. <laughs> Though we both had a crush on him at different times, as perhaps the Virgin Mary might have developed a crush on the angel Gabriel when he whispered in her ear that she was really something special, <laughs> that something momentous was about to happen to her. Bruce was tall and thin, and like Bob, he had beautiful eyes. People said he had a doctorate from UC Berkeley, that he was the first person to write a dissertation on Frank O'Hara. His interests included Zen, Bataille, Marxism, boys, film, the Gnostics, reaching always for an impossible clarity. Steve Abbott had a different role. He was the spark plug that every scene depends on without perhaps realizing just how much it needs him. As a journalist and publicist, he was connected to a smorgasbord of California national and international writing trends. In his youth, he had been a 
Baby Beat, a poetry and anti-war activist who had arranged for Ginsburg to make the road trip to Kansas, during which he wrote his famous Wichita Vortex Sutra. In Georgia, Steve had married and fathered a baby girl. Tragically, his wife had been killed in a crash. And he was bringing up in a flat on the corner of Haight and Ashbury, his daughter, Alicia, a single gay dad on top of everything else he did. He loved his Bob Kaufman and he also loved George Perec, June Jordan, George Bataille, Kathy Acker. We in the workshop, in Bob's workshop, weren't young. Not young, young. We had been involved in other scenes, maybe found them not emotionally fulfilling or aesthetically inspiring. To make a change at age 30 is like pulling feet in heavy boots out of mud. But we were looking for something else, something rarefied. <laughs> it's a shame Robert Bresson, then ending his active career in films, didn't come to small press traffic, <laughs> to watch us struggling in Bob's workshop for surely our desperation and inchoate earnestness would have appealed to him. We longed for a scrap of praise from Bob, and when he told X or Y that their work was crisp or lapidary, we nearly died. <laughs> and we went home and we wrote harder and harder and harder. Um, well, it goes on like that. <laughs> About the, the, the workshops at Small Press, the original Small Press Traffic, but it goes through like another 20 years of, of uh, what Dodie and I followed as the progression of new narrative. To a certain point in 1997, we ended our story. And um, uh, for several reasons. And one of them was because it was the, kind of the end of AIDS at that moment, or the defeat by a combination of drug, drug cocktails that kind of put a stop to it in our lives for the most part. And also it was the beginning of the internet which changed everything about writing and, and the media um, and community mm -hmm. in a big way later. Um, I just, I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> skip to the end. All modes of writing and communication were affected by the worldwide AIDS epidemic, but for New Narrative, with its twin commitments to political action and full sexual expression, AIDS really threw us for a loop. The whispers that grew louder and larger, the gossip that turned into truth, the shock that turned into fury, these were narrative maneuvers that history and maddening government indifference took from us, making them, in, because a lot of what we were talking about was about, we were interested in gossip, and scandal, and shock, and then all these things were thrown back at us. They, making them instead the very machines of life and death, a vapid irony filled the air. Our new writing initiative had been doing so well, and now, not only were our very subjects, sex and death, turned back on us in preposterous fashion, but indeed we were reduced to mere Nero's fiddling in the face of what seemed suddenly a global holocaust. When in his story, Dear Secret Diary, Dennis Cooper wrote that AIDS ruined death, his bald formation, ostensibly awkward, crystallized what many of us knew in our hearts. We had had a romantic relationship with death, and with love itself, and with sex, and Bataille had done most of our thinking for us. <laughs> Bataille wrote that there is no communication except between two lacerations. If you're not wounded, then you can't be touched. AIDS robbed us of that particularly th theoretical framework and in our eyes reduced new narrative to just another useless clump of ego, delaying or even preventing direct political action. All of us then, according to our different constitutions, coped with the quandary of how to distribute our energy to achieve the greatest good. AIDS made community all the more important. For 
while decimating errors in particular. Indeed, AIDS gave living a cruel meaning for a decade or more, even while scraping away at every one of life's lineaments, its comforts. To AIDS, new narrative lost Sam D'Alessandro, Steve Abbott, and a slew, of, a slew of other artists important to us, from Hervé Biber to Derek Jarman, to Reynaldo Arenas, to Cookie Mueller, to Essex Hemphill, from Reza Abdo to David Wojnarowicz. Now, new narratives, deeply Emersonian optimism, forged in sunnier times, allowed the movement to soldier on during the AIDS crisis, but just barely. Although the agitprop strategies of tell, don't show did prepare us for a new wave of direct political action and the abandonment of conventional rhetorical elegance the crisis demanded. It was our idea that the MFA program era saying of, you know, show, don't tell was something that New Narrative was interested in reversing. Like, why show? You know, just tell. <laughs> New combination therapies, the so-called drug cocktail, came into general use in 1995, just about the same moment as the internet took the world by storm. Its speed and its promise offering a relief from years of depredation, and of course, forcing writing into another enormous sea change, one with which we are still grappling. Kathy Acker, always ahead of the curve, bragged she often spent four hours a day online. And we were like, what? <laughs> like she was some kind of IT goddess. <laughs> we, we literally did not believe her. <laughs> what devotion to a machine. Nobody could spend that much time online. <laughs> New narrative was part of the last pre-digital avant-garde. Much of what's included in our book was composed of, during the ancien regime of the typewriter. <laughs> We did our graphics peeling and pasting old-fashioned hand lettering or of typeset, pasted up on drafting tables. Through new narrative, though new narrative then may have been an analog culture. It presaged the fragmentation, the information overload, the fren frenetic bleed of emotions, and the general mess of the digital era. The writing was anticipating a new era of multivalence a new concept of the boundaries of selfhood. And when the new era finally arrived, we had some, in some mystical fashion, midwived it, or so we believed. Just as, in no, just as no individual writing takes place in isolation, no literary movement takes place in isolation. All movements are in conversation not only with the past, but with the larger contemporary community of literary production in editing our anthology, we wanted to capture some of these larger conversations that a group of San Francisco writers were having with kindred writers scattered along both coasts of the US and, and in Canada. In our book, writers had to grapple with AIDS, with the new right, the corresponding rise of neoliberalism, with the specter of increased professionalization in the arts, and maybe the luckiest movements find a way to converse with the future. When digital culture came along, new narrative rebooted itself, like Colette's aging courtesan Leia, <laughs> when she spots the young, attractive, maybe manic, Sherry. The well of awkward social formation never runs dry. <laughs> in those days of in these days of instant communication, we marvel that these connections and conversations were happening through the mail, through journeys, through the, by the, the, through the then exorbitant cost of long distance phone calls. By 1997, when our book was ending, the internet was just beginning to redesign our lives. We cannot relive our past, but gathering together and sharing these seminal works that formed who we are as writers and what it means to be a writer and to exist as a writer within a community is as close as we can get to returning to those golden days when we discovered or thought we had at any rate a new kind of writing 
a new way to interact with the world. Thanks. I want to bring up Tony Bell. Is that better? All right. It's comforting to me. Okay. So. so what I did here was pretty much inspired by Matthias Wiegener asked me for a PDF of the letters of Mina Harker, which doesn't exist, but I made him one from the manuscript. And so I got to looking at the manuscript and uh, thinking about how our anthology is a sort of annotation to my first book, The Letters of Mina Harker. Well, the book centers on locals such as Bob Gluck, Bruce Boone, Steve Abbott, Camille Roy, Michael Anderson, and of course, Kevin Killian. Uh, many others in our anthology uh, are addressed in Mina. Originally, letters were sent to Leslie Dick, Gail Scott, Lori Weeks, Richard Hawkins, and traces of them remain. There are references to Lynn Tillman, Kathy Acker, Scott Watson, uh, Naylan Blake, Cecilia Doherty, and Kathy Burkhardt. I'm sure there's more since some people's identities were hidden or merged. There are references to all our panelists except Gabrielle. When I recall some of the stories Gabrielle told me back in the day, I realized I missed some great opportunities. <laughs> so I, I just a little montage. Eileen, and there are excerpts from the letters of Mina Harker. Dion appeared grinning behind two juice glasses full of wine. The next thing I remember, the man had disappeared and the pregnant woman was hysterical. He'd taken her bag. A few minutes later, the man returned and said yes, he had her bag and that he would take her to it. Then she left with him, and I was feeling disoriented. Just like Eileen Miles did in India, Eileen locked herself in a hotel room for a few days and read the most American book she could find. I went to the bathroom, sat on the toilet, merging with the unbroken mass of graffiti vining the walls, meaning painted upon meaning, cryptic and decipherable. Dennis, sex, with Dion's, sex was never Dion's main source of arousal. When Dennis tires of his narrative, he excites himself by murdering an unsuspecting character. <laughs> I want to be one of those people whose problems are so big, social scientists write books about them. <laughs> Here's another dentist. There's lots of dentists, but I'll do another one. Because at the end of this dentist, Earl Jackson, who's at the conference, comes in. Dennis and I emerge from the parking garage, walk to international arrivals, wait in the airless fluorescence for Earl's flight from Amsterdam. A short woman in a shawl descends, a gently sloping ramp, her roundness and advanced age announcing a cozy, old worldness. Slowly she places one foot directly in front of the other. Still she falters and grabs the rail. An eager triad, man, woman, girl, watch on. Their faces wrapped with her progress. They reach out their arms, spread their fingers, suction cups pulling her closer. Mama! When she finally steps off the ramp, they run over the yellow line of no entry clamp onto her cabbage-scented body, squirming and groaning. We stand beside this gyrating clump of three generations. Lips pucker, shoulders are squeezed, waist encircled, cheeks rubbed. Their weeping escalates to wails, salty tears streaming down their faces. Mama, mama. Dennis is caught up in them too. He blurts out, can you imagine feeling that much? <laughs> I think of the night Quincy left me, the door slammed and I ceased to be a woman or any abstraction for that matter. I was a body that ate and shit and sniveled and resonated with pain, basso profundo. KK held me in his arms to keep me from vibrating off the edge of the bed. I think of those four or five days each month when the decision to keep Dodie alive is gruelingly weighed. The Mina Harker slouched before this terminal is no accident. 
Earl rushes toward us, hickeys blotching his neck, rope burns on wrists. He checked out every sex club on Dennis's map. Black leather bag bouncing against his thigh. He spent his vacation in a coffin. Great, he exclaims, it was great. <laughs> Roberto. It was on Valencia Street, and this is uh, from a letter to Sam D'Alessandro. It was on Valencia Street that I first saw you, the same block where Roberto and Brian got into the fist fight, maybe the same night. I was having trouble with my outfit, a plaid disaster no amount of attitude could camouflage. <laughs> when you appeared before me, my mouth dropped open, the kind of guy who steals the foreground from every background. Now that I'm married and you're dead, I have all the time in the world for you, but the question is, what world? Another one with Roberto. <clears throat> I lost the photos from my wedding. All that remains is a contact sheet, black and white miniatures of insect people at some sort of ceremony. As I place a loop against the scratched matte surface, Roberto's backyard leaps forward. Wooden stairs, three-tiered cake crowned with wildflowers, clusters of starving artists orbiting around plates and champagne punch. Potato salad, elbows, bushes, folding chairs. Life seems so manageable through my convex bubble. Nothing but clicks in time. That's me standing in the center of rectangle 14. Cotton lace and cheek length bob, bright as infrared. My eyes are closed, my smile inward and serene. Helium balloons float above my head like wishes that have all been answered. And then one more little line about Kathy Acker. Then I remembered how Kathy Acker met the Zen monk. Quote, he kind of jumped on me after my reading. And these days, I'm very jumpable. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, that was just to, to uh, demonstrate <laughs> our community thing. So I'm going to turn this over to these people. Gabriel, maybe you'd like to come up and, sure. and read your paper? Or whatever it is. <laughs> Most of us are just talking very informally so we can end quickly and go to lunch. <laughs> well, um, I'm an outrider. I'm a fellow traveler. Um, I'm very nervous too. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I put down these things around four o'clock this morning. And so you'll have to forgive me if I'm jumping around a lot, but um, this is what I have here. Um, I think it, it was Zora Neale Hurston who wrote that women tend to recall the things that are important to them and then forget the things that aren't, like discerning what's treasure and what isn't. When I was a little girl, I declared that I wanted to remember everything. I was an autodidact who picked up books and read them at four. And some teachers or family said that I had a real facility for remembering important dates and names and incidents from history, which remains one of my first loves. These days, I find that I am disappointed by the fact that there is much that I don't remember anymore. Nowadays, Wikipedia or the web page, the web jogs by memory, helps me to recall things or documentaries, or even music about a certain time or place, how old I was, who I was in love with. All that's left are feelings, and not necessarily what happened or who did it. Not specific days or seasons or months of the year or even particular years, just how I felt. I hope that some of you today can help me with that. I'd like to evoke a time when there were more independent bookstores in San Francisco, when you really didn't have to have a book written to read your poetry or prose at a store, and people went to poetry meetings guided by word of mouth or by poetry flash. That's how I found small press traffic. 
I was 23. I liked that a bookstore was situated in what could be someone's parlor. And I looked around and touched and explored. Of course, I had no idea what might be happening in the rest of the store. I mean, the rest of the flat. I think that I bought a book by H.D. there and something else. I like to think that it was Bob changing the, the bills and getting changed, but I can't recall for sure. <laughs> what I did know was that I wanted to go somewhere with my writing. I applied for about 100 journalism jobs, print and electronic, after graduating from San Jose State in 1976. They were both inside and outside California, and nothing came of it. However, I had always been creative. I still wanted to write poetry and prose, but I also wanted to be part of something. This is strange, because even in my two families, I'm on the outside looking in, as the old soul song goes. They hardly know what I do, or write, or understand it even now. I'd always been interested in women's issues. I'd graduated long ago from Ms. Magazine to Off Our Backs. And because I had missed out on the civil rights struggle and was alienated from some aspects of black liberation politics, I gradually became sympathetic towards gay rights. Uh, I figured if you're going to go, go all the way. Um, forget all this stuff about, um, oh, well, you've heard some of this stuff. Um, lesbians and gays of color are keeping back the black race. And I just figured, no, I wasn't going to do that. I think now that when I marched for gays and lesbians, and uh, I remember right now thinking of uh, Bruce and Bob tearing out of the uh, out of the crowd at one point and grabbing uh, people who were in the Women Writers Union at the time and hugging us and kissing us when we were going past. Um, I also marched to be out front about love between whites and blacks and people of color. Because in those days, as even now, interracial sex and love was fetishized and dehumanized as a thing that happened with a john and a trick. When it wasn't, it's trying to get beyond labels and ways of think, seeing and thinking and living. It's a lot more complicated, like life. I think my next memory comes from attending Gloria Anzaldua's course, El Mundo Cerdo, or The Left-Handed World. That's how I was introduced to her and to her work. She gave me my second reading in San Francisco at Small Press Traffic, and that's how I became aware of another larger world. However, I was never in Bob Gluck's workshop. I wish, though, that I had attended, because it would have prepared me for what to expect in graduate school. My introduction to new narrative came from Bruce Boone and the late Steve Abbott. I think it all came together after all those readings and talks and socializing after I left the Women Writers Union. I wanted to concentrate, it, I wanted to concentrate less on polemics and more on the writing, and that's what I did. I call it a, an apprenticeship. They both suggested where I might place my work. Steve suggested that I attend monthly readings of the No Oratorial Society. I don't know whether they still are around. Um, Bruce recommended that I should try responding to films like Terminal Station. I don't know whether you've seen Terminal Station or not, but it is a one note of people who just cannot break up. <laughs> oh, it drove me crazy. It drove me crazy at the time. Anyway. And while those attempts may have had different outcomes, they were training. They led to my eventually reviewing books for the San Francisco Chronicle in the mid-80s and my attempting a first novel. I also went on what I would call now call field trips with Bruce and Steve. I recall attending an expressionist art exhibition with Bruce at the site of the old MoMA on the that it used to be on Van Ness Avenue. And I think I would, went into shock seeing buxom, big-assed blue horses. It also meant that I had to do more reading about this time before World War I, too. 
And then I went to see a film with Steve about punk music at the Old York Theater, starring groups like The Special, Selector, and The Beat. I also think that I saw the, in the realm of the senses there with Steve, with this theater packed to the rafters. It was a double, it was a double bill with another sexy Japanese film. And every, every, you know, the place was packed to the rafters and we were in the balcony. And I'd never seen anything like that in my life. <laughs> Especially since it was based on a true story. And after I, after I saw that movie, I went to find out what it really happened and everything and the, the new story about what happened. But it was a time for my mind to be blown. I mean, here I was, I was raised in the suburbs and uh, um, lower middle class black people. And uh, I saw all that stuff on TV, you know, Partridge Family and Here Come the Brides and all that other stuff. This is nothing like that. And that's why I, uh, I don't have any reference. I can reference those things with my, with my family, but I can't reference it and reference what I do with my own work to them, okay? So, um, I think that, like I said, I think these outings as well as the dinners and the coffees and just playing get-togethers or just running into each other on 24th Street um, were also meant to educate me, to get me out of my comfort zone, um, as well as encouragement to keep writing, no matter what it was. Just like their writing and that of Frank O'Hara or Robert Duncan, I needed all that to grow. Eventually, I had to return home to my own writing, and that means African American literature. Now, before writing the essay on Our Nick, which is in the book, I also reviewed that I also reviewed for Chronicle. I hadn't cracked poetry or novels or essays other than those by the black feminists, you know. Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, and Tazaki Shange, and maybe a little Nikki Giovanni. I had to know what I was doing, where I was really coming from, so I went back, all the way back to the beginning, even reading from critics like Robert Bone to Addison Gale to Charles Johnson, while holding my nose about their antipathy about black women writing. And I went all the way back through Wright and Baldwin, and finally what is now known as the Black Arts Movement that I had so much of a problem with. And to find out that I did like some of this stuff, and I still didn't like other stuff. And I rediscovered some other people. And in between, I was even able to discover the writing of Carlene Hatcher Polite, who wrote The Flagellants. Carol Olivia Harone, the author of Thereafter Johnny, and that of Gail Jones, who wrote Corregidora and Eva's Man. And these are books that I believe talks about black people trying to deal with each other. Um, some of it is very violent. A lot of it is sexually charged. And I found that if I hadn't been with new narrative. I wouldn't have been able to go back to those things and critique those things in a way that felt like I wasn't drawing away from them, that they were mine and these were documents for me as well. So I had that background and it had to be with Bruce and Steve and Bob. So if I wasn't as clear, or as productive, or as courageous then, I feel that I'm more so now. And as I'm also fond of saying, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> My new writing incorporates most of what I've learned and experienced between those readings, those fights, those dinners, and between the gossip, and especially the laughing. So if anything, this is always something that I'll remember. Thank you. I 
call you all to the, to the <laughs> microphone. Who wants to con continue? Okay. Roberto Bedoya. Uh, where's Bob? Oh, he just left. Uh, Bob, look, introduce, there you are, Bob. He introduced me once to, at a group, at a gathering. Uh, Roberto was part of my workshop, and I had to stop him, and I said, no, I dated guys at the workshop. I wasn't in the workshop. And in some ways, I was part of a circle of friendships that were really important in my life, uh, associated with the new narrative school of writers. Uh, obviously, Bob, Dodie, and Kevin, I was lucky enough to, to um, I had a house on Fair Oak Street near 24th. I had a backyard. They got married. Come on, have the reception in my house. So that was really a sweet moment. Uh, that fight that Dodi referred to was the only fight I've ever gotten into. <laughs> and it was with a, you know, a, a love affair that had gone really sour. You know how you have that thing where you, you fall for that, what is that called? A bad object choice or something like that? <laughs> you know, he's like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. You know, it's just, anyway, that's a story. Uh, I want to, and then Robin interviewed me for this, for however to, and she really pumped my memory about my association with the New Narrative School of Writers. And, um, yeah, I'm guilty by association. But I guess what I want to also say that I ran a literary series in San Francisco called Intersection, and I supported this, this these, my colleagues, my friends, my lovers, uh, through this moment in time, and I was feeling incredibly lucky. So to tell the narrative of the support system for new narrative, it's really important to look at venues. And I can look at my colleagues here, uh, Eileen was at St. Mark's, Dennis was at Beyond Brook, Dodi was at, and Kevin were small press traffic. So not only was there writing practice, there was a support system of uh, venues, not just publishing, but actually where you could sit and, and um, kind of build this communal work. So I want to read a quote uh, for one of my more important uh, writers I love, it's from Robin Blazer. And it goes, cultural conditions always approach what we mean by the word world, or the process of composing with, composing with. The world is never separately social, political, artistic, or sacred, but rather it is made up of the entanglement of discourses to do with man, women, earth, and heaven. So I often think that Part of the, what I love about this quote is sort of this notion of composing the world. What I love about the new narrative sort of posse, I'll call them, is the, the composing that they are engaged in, and it's all about entanglements. It really is the entanglement of men and women and earth and heaven. So that, that is really kind of a guiding sort of haunting phrase in my life. Now, I run cultural affairs for the city of Oakland. I'm a policy wonk. And so, basically, I've been doing uh, kind of arts management policy work for a really long time. And I think where my voice in that orbit is like, it's hard for me to say this, but I'm going to say it. But Roberto Tejada was talking to me one time, he said, oh, Roberto, you're a new narrative policy wonk. <laughs> I can, I can claim that, I can claim that, because I'm not afraid of the lie, I'm not afraid of a little lyricism, I'm not afraid of ghosts coming into my argument, so those, 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 those things are really, I mean, you should, yeah, anyway, if you're a Rockefeller Foundation, you saw something from Bedoya, you'd go, oh my god, what the hell is going on here? But I got 100K at the end of the day, so it's a good thing. Uh, and I guess my last little comment, because I really do want to um, kind of keep my comments brief here. I had the pleasure of introducing Eileen uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, at a reading in Tucson. And you know, you back in the day at the intersection, all I did was just 
here's Joe and lists the titles of the books and I didn't try to contextualize their work so much. Now it's like there's like a whole little pre-show of like the, the introduction, you know? And it's like, okay, okay, okay. But I felt I obligated because of my friendship with, with uh, Eileen. And in that, in writing that up, writing my comments, I sort of ended up writing this line about aesthetic ordering and being inside and outside of aesthetic ordering. And I thought to myself, yeah, that's Eileen. She kind of goes like this. And I said, wait a second, everybody on this panel does that. I mean, in some ways, they're engaged in some kind of new aesthetic ordering, and they're inside and outside at the same time. So, and then a reference to Gabrielle and myself as a person of color in this orbit of new narrative, love. Steve was really uh, wonderful. Where'd that come from? Woo! Um, that, so anyway, the fact that I, I kept thinking about my older sister who, she's about 10 years older than me and she's been gone for a while, but she loved Little Anthony and the Imperials, that song, and she would play it all the time. I'm, I'm on the outside looking in, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, and I'm not, you know. So this notion and this fetishizing of the other of othering and how it worked and how that lament was so a part of my youth and my sound. And then years later, you know, here in San Francisco, you know, you run into the, you go to a Patti Smith concert. Outside is the side I take! You know, and so there's this way in which you flip outside and how you go in and out. So I just say that because I think there's a way in which new narrative for me and what I love about the, the writers is that in and out is the poorest terrain of, of imagination. So, thank you. Um, I'm just going to rack my brains and try to remember how I actually met these guys, uh, the New writers, and how that all happened relative to me, and try not to meander. Um, the first time I actually met a writer, a new narrative writer, who wasn't yet a new narrative writer, was in the mid-70s. And there was this big uh, reading in San Francisco, like it was like this big gay poetry shebang thing, the Glide Church. And uh, it was like uh, Allen Ginsberg and Peter Olofsky and Harold Norris and James Broughton and maybe John Reggie. I don't remember. But there was those big guys, and then they have these kind of like upstarts or like fresh meat or people who are like the young ones. And, uh, and I was one of them, and Robert Glick was one of them, and Aaron Shuren was one of them back when he used to wiggle his hips when he read it. <laughs> or him back then. And maybe someone else, I can't remember. Anyway, it, I met Bob, and I think we just like shook hands and grunted at each other because I don't think we really knew each other's work or anything. And so, and that was it basically. And then I just like forgot about Glucky and existed for a while. And I went back to Los, to Los Angeles. And, um, and then at a certain point, um, Steve Abbott, I was doing this magazine called Little Caesar. Um, it's like a poetry artsy magazine. Uh, and um, I think Steve Abbott was really interested in Little Caesar, and, um, and I was writing these kind of, um, kind of like gloomy, sexy gay poems, and uh, about young, t you know, drug, drugged out and disappointed boys and stuff, which I don't do anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now I write fiction about those things, and uh, he, I think he liked those too, but uh, I remember he started writing to me, and uh, so I got to know him first, and he, and he contributed to Little Caesar and stuff. And I'm pretty sure that through him was the verse that I started, I knew of like Kevin, Killian, and Dodie Bellamy, and reacquainted myself with Bob Gluck and Bruce Boone. I'm pretty sure that Steve was the one that kind of like said, oh, you should really know these guys, and I don't know, maybe he did the same thing with them, or maybe they already knew about my magazine. But I'm pretty sure it was through Steve um, that I actually reacquainted myself and met these people, so. Um, and, and, and I don't remember how I met them, though. I don't. 
remember meeting Kevin or Doty. I'm assuming I probably came up and there was a reading and we bumped into each other. Bob had a, had a small press traffic and you read with Carla. Okay. Uh, yeah, I read with Carla Harriman at small press traffic. And so I met them. And, <laughs> uh, and, um, and then I met, and I met you know, Bob and Bruce that way. And I didn't, I met, but I never really got to know um, Michael Anderson and, uh, and uh, Camille Roy and um, San Alessandro, but I really liked their work. So anyway, so that, there was that. And then at some point there was this, um, again, I think first through Steve, because he and I were the closest in touch, he started talking about this new narrative thing. That it was like there was this name, new narrative, and it was sort of being kind of like, it was creating this kind of boundary around these writers. And, um, uh, and then, I, then that became kind of a thing, and Bob was talking about it, and then the contextualization seemed like it became kind of like a real thing, and people, and I know Earl Jackson was supporting it, and, and, uh, and, um, and that was really exciting because um, I, and I, I guess I, I don't know if I was ever, or I am a new narrative writer, but there was some kind of kinship there, and I felt, um, I felt a really big kinship with all of these writers, and, um, and I was super grateful they did with me because at that point, even though I had always wanted to be a fiction writer since I decided to be a writer when I was a teenager, my fiction was like incredibly, incredibly bad, and my my talent was whatever talent I had was like really roughshod, and in my poetry too. But for some reason, like they seemed to have some kind of interest in me, and uh, it was actually kind of a really big deal because. Uh, I didn't really feel that so much, and in Los Angeles there was in this, this poetry scene, that kind of poetry scene that I was a part of it, Beyond Baroque, and it was like me and um, Amy Gersler and Bob Flanagan and David Trinidad, and uh, really the only fiction writer was Benjamin Weissman. So they were all poets, and it was the same in New York, all my friends in New York were poets, all my poets. So it was really, it was really kind of interesting to me to, to feel like there was some kind of simpatico thing going on, some kind of interest in what I was doing from people who were doing work that was the kind of work that I really wanted to do. Because well, they read the same people I did and they had the same, generally the same kind of influences and things, but they had managed, they had, they were able to bring that into their work and to me at that point it was, I didn't know how to do that and I was really, was writing fiction very completely just in my notebooks and stuff. So, 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 um, so it was, it's actually a really, really big deal to me to be, sort of feel like I was somehow connected with those people. Uh, and, and it influenced my work enormously. It was very encouraging, and, and uh, of course their early works were um, really important to me. The, the books of Bob and Bruce and Kevin and, and then Kathy Acker, and so. Uh, and then, yeah, then there was this new narrative thing, and then, and then I guess I was sort of, seen, sometimes I was sort of part of it, and like Kathy Acker, and, and maybe sometimes we weren't, and, but I always liked it because I, my work's been like lumped in with all these like you know gay fiction and transgressive fiction, and downtown writing and all these things, <laughs> and like new narrative was like the one I really like was proud of because it I mean one because it sounds like really serious and it is <laughs> as opposed to you know, downtown writing. <laughs> so so anyway. So it's always been uh, so, and then now I've become you know lifelong friends with these people, and they're like my favorite writers and everything. So, so, uh, so yeah. So I guess that's it. That's that's it. Thank you. Hi, it's nice to be here. Um, ooh, this is a real mic. Um, I'm gonna kind of. I've been thinking about this for a few days. Um, and I want to make a little, I'm trying, I have a map, but I don't really have a narrative. Um, maybe I'll start with, with how, I, how I found Kevin and Doty, which was um, sometime in the 80s, late 80s, I'd been submitting, I'd been writing and submitting, and no, no one was interested. And my first acceptance was from Mirage, from Kevin Killian, and I knew who Doty was. And I was in, I, I had a pile of mail, and I was in New York with, um, for the summer. Um, with my parents, and we were driving back to the city from upstate, and I was in the back seat, and it was getting dark, I could see the moon, and, um, you know, 
I was in my way that you are when you're that age and didn't really want to be there. I was like lying on the back seat with my feet almost sticking out the window when I was opening mail. And I told my parents I got accepted, I got accepted, you know, by magazine. And, and they were like, God, it's good, it's good. And my, then my mother said, well, what's the name of the magazine? And I said, Mirage. She said, Mirage. And I could tell they were both thinking that the, that the Mirage was mine. Um, the, um, so, um, after that, I, uh, I don't know, the year after that, 1990, 89, I can't get the dates right, but I, I was up here in Berkeley for a summer seminar, a big, big fancy um, support and doubt summer seminar, and um, I got to really spend time with Kevin and Doty, and then through them met um, Bob and met Bruce, I actually met Bruce Boone first, and when I, I had been reading My Walk with Bob, and when I walked in to meet Bruce, I said, it's nice to meet you, Bob. Uh, it, was, it was a very, he, did, he was not happy, um, he was very unhappy. Um, but I think it belongs in the, fits well in the new narrative narrative. Um, the, um, I don't know if I met Roberto through Kevin and Doty, who he certainly knew, but it was probable, right? Um, but then Roberto moved to LA right around that time and became the director of LACE, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, and we became very close, and I think just before that, um, Roberto had me to, no, I think you were already in LA, and we drove to San Francisco to read together at Intersections, and Kathy Acker came, who I'd met um, through some other mutual friends earlier, and, um, oh no, no, I know the narrative. <laughs> Kathy, so Kathy, I met Kathy, it's a great, it's a great story, I met Kathy because of Dennis. Um, at some point after Kathy had moved to San Francisco, Dennis, she came to LA to visit, and Dennis had a party, and I was, um, I was there, and Kathy was there, and at some point, and I was much shyer then than I am now, and I was doing what I, what I would do, which was I'd go to the bookshelves and pretend to be really interested in the books. Um, and, and, and I was, especially Dennis's books, and I looked next to me, and there was Kathy, either pretending or really interested in the books. And we started talking about the books, um, and I think that's like a, it's, it's a, it's kind of an iconic for how a lot of us connected. We connected through the books we liked. Um, it, was, it was very powerful. Um, the um, so Kathy came to. Um, <coughs> Roberto and my reading, and I was, I think I was staying with, with Kevin and Dodie at that point, and she left a long message on the answer, gushing message on the answering machine for me, um, which Dodie took note of, um, and that helped a lot for, you know, helped move me up a little. Um, the, um, and in that, probably not that, but another meeting, an another time I was here staying with Kevin and Doty, Eileen was staying here too, um, and I walked in one day to find Eileen and Doty in a really heated argument, like a shouting, screaming argument. Um, I won't say more, but I don't have to because they've both written about it. Um, <laughs> And I remember feeling really weird, um, <laughs> and you know, and I re and, and and I kind of was like diagramming why I felt so weird, and I realized on some level it's like when you're in a family and your parents are fighting, and it's you, you know it's like don't don't do you know don't do this. I don't want to be here. Um, and I realized it had some bearing to my own family, and that some like like little implant happened when I opened that letter in the back seat of the car. Um, not that Kevin and Dodie are my parents, because we're not very far apart in age. But, um, so, um, the, um, you know, also, like, just our parents. I was, I was rereading, um, this week from my presentation earlier, I was, I was rereading Jack the Modernist and the letters of Mina Harker and Kathy's, uh, Childlike Life of the Black Tarantula, and, um, I had just finished Eileen Miles' brilliant new book, Afterglow, um, and uh, I was like, 
these are my people. This is these these are the writers I care about. This is the stuff that you know. I don't think it influenced me so much because I I was sort of I came up with it right. Um, but I I didn't feel until now that I belonged in this set actually. Um, it, it you know, and it's a kind of remarkable thing because you're like all of us were like thrown into these families, right? The these people, these two people, sometimes two, sometimes just one, right? And you're in a country, and you're in a town, in a neighborhood, and you're it's you're really thrown into the world, right? And then you get a choice, and and you end up somewhere else, right? And you make new friends, or you fall in love, and but you know even that is like a it, it's almost close to the first thing because there's so much randomness involved like where you go to school or if you go to school or or where you get a job or can afford to live um, you know and I piecing it together so many of the people here um, have become fixtures in my life and it, it feels miraculous to me that I kind of took a leap out of out of one nest that wasn't wasn't so bad but it wasn't wasn't the right nest um, and ended up in this one. Um, really remarkable. So I want to just tie in. Um, so Dennis um, was one, also one of the first people who published me, and I forget in what what order, but in the anthology Discontents, and um, in um, the catalog for the for the Against Nature show at Lace, this self same space, um, and Eileen. I think I knew before then through Liz Coates, because Eileen and Liz edited the new Fuck You. Um, I think, I, I can't piece together the exact beginning of knowing Eileen. So, I don't have a conclusion other than there's something about um, the choices we make and, and the books we read. And I, I guess one last note I could add is that like, I, so I was like a academic, you know, critical theory, kid, um, when I was right after college, I went to graduate school to be an academic, and I was reading kind of hardcore, you know, French theory, Derrida, um, Deleuze, Foucault, um, and through Bruce, actually, I got to Bataille, which was really life-changing, um, and through Dennis, I, I'd already been reading Genet, but I really didn't understand the Marquis de Sade, and, and, and that, that kind of opened up for me, right? So that also got very pulled in, and I just taught the Marquis de Sade last week. And one of the things we noticed was the incredible level of sociality, I mean, cruelty and brutality, but also sociality in his work. So here we have um, not so much cruelty and a lot of sociality. Thank you. Thank you.